Here we are, back at it again, another episode of the Artistry of Podcast. It is I, your host. Let me introduce you to Bo Miles, a unique and likable guy. Everyday life, friends and family. All right, so last week I recorded an episode and I recorded it um, using using OBS. So I recorded it using OBS and because I was going to do the Jeffrey Dahmer episode where we um, check out the confessions of a serial killer. The interview with him, his dad. And uh, some other guy, right? So that's why, you know, I set it up on that platform so that we can um, just go ahead and listen and react together. Because um, I was I finished the show. So I watched it. I finished it last week. And I was going to sum it up. Well, during the recap of the week. I got into a really good discussion and that recap lasted for like, I want to say maybe 30, 35 minutes. I'm like, yo, I might as well just ride out this recap with the episode and we just do the Dahmer next week. So I'm riding it out and um, I go to get ready to process it and get everything together, get everything ready. And boom, there's no sound like there's no sound wave. I'm like, all right, well, this is. This is normal. It could just be a, a small, a small wave. So I crack it open and boom, there's still no sound wave. So I'm like, yo, yo, come on. And uh, that was that. So that episode, like I said, it was fire. It was so fire that I didn't even want to record another episode after that. I'm like, yo, man, it was just lost. So. The heart of the things, because I don't think I'm going to be able to like re say everything is going to be perfect. But the key points we're going to we're going to hit on that next week. So um, so we're going to go ahead and jump into this Dahmer before we jump into the Dahmer interview. I do want to say that I did look at the and before I even look, but I did look at those um polaroids the polaroids that he took and you know it was just gruesome like it was it was horrific it was gruesome it was uh just disgusting that that a person that a person would do that so i I bring that up because like i'm not trying to uh hero what would it be it wouldn't be heronized um but i'm not trying to make a hero out of Dahmer. I'm not trying to make anybody feel sorry for him. Um, But one thing that I do understand is that, I mean, we're all human. And, oh, and I'm definitely going to find, there was another interview with, um, with the guy who, who did the Sandy Hook. He called in, he called in, and I, I talked about this before, I talked about this before and I'm going to find it um, I'm going to find it on this episode right and I, I don't know if I'm going to start it off with that but or if we're going to put it in 
somewhere, but somewhere in there, I'm going to, I'm going to play that because, because it was very, um, enlightening. And I think what's his name? Uh, George Peel. Is that Peel? Is his name George? I don't know if his name is George, (laughs) but, um, the director of uh us and i was about to say nope i don't think he did a movie called nope but what was his first movie get out so get out and us and his latest movie which is the um the thriller the sci-fi uh, alien type of a uh, movie right so he talks about the same type of concept a little bit, just a little bit. He really doesn't talk about it, but he makes reference to the same thing that this, that the killer from the Sandy hook. And like I said, I'm not trying to take away from the tragedies that these two um, killers inflicted on their victims. Right. So um, like I said, I just wanted to say that before we even got into the Dahmer because it could seem like like yo we're we're rocking with Dahmer on this and we're not like yo like I'm not um but there is still information to be learned it's still stuff to be learned about about true human nature because I feel like it's all just pretend like we're just living this pretend where you got to pretend to be this and pretend to be that and of course we I wouldn't say that we're like Dahmer but somewhere in there um we all have these type of traits now of course we're all like picasso we're all like da vinci we're all like bundy right but the whole thing is that certain elements we pull in those directions where one was obsessed with art and one was obsessed with music another was obsessed with murdering women or another was assessed with uh murdering uh men so but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna explore this so let's go ahead and jump into it and um bada bing bada boom let's go ahead let's get in there all right so it's like due to mature mature Jeffrey Dahmer brutally murdered 17 young men and boys. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like it had control of my life from there on in. His killing spree lasted more than a decade, and the horror didn't stop at murder. Was there something sexual in the dismemberment of the bodies for you? Yes, it was a sexual part, part to that. Why the cannibalism? How could a seemingly normal Midwestern boy grow up to commit such terrible crimes? Dahmer's parents struggled to find the answers. It's been eternal torment. Is, uh, do you game. feel that you're being blamed? Yes, I, I do. Yes. Dahmer agreed to speak with us at the behest of his father, who had just written a revealing book. Is there anything in this book that you strongly disagree with? Uh, yes. On the surface, the interview with Lionel Dahmer was matter of fact. Well, you were holding back your emotions. Yeah. Time. But beneath his composure, unbearable pain. But they don't realize that I have very deep feelings inside. The interview with Jeffrey Dahmer's mother, Joyce, was often contentious. I, I don't mean to argue with you. I have no business to I, I am really scared. I interviewed Jeffrey Dahmer and his parents at length in 1994. Much of what they shared has never been heard until now. MSNBC brings you the never-before-seen Confessions of a Serial Killer. joining us. I'm Stone Phillips. In February 1994, at the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin, I sat down with serial killer Jeffrey Dahmer for his first, and as it turned out, his last network television interview. His father, Lionel Dahmer, had just written a book about his son, and he joined us. 
Jeff, as his father called him, was polite and seemed unnervingly normal. Rarely had a serial killer spoken in such detail about his crimes or the possible root causes. But this father and son spoke about both, as did Dahmer's mother in a rare interview. As you'll see, even looking back more than a decade later, there are still no easy answers. Hi, Jim. Sherry, how are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Hi, Jim. Hi, Mr. Phillips. How are you? Good to see you. I've spending the last few days with your folks. Great. Talking about a lot of different things. Hey, you're lucky you came up on a day when there's no snow. It's snowing like crazy all weekend. Is that right? Yeah. How are things going here for you? Uh, slow and steady. Nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, really. You've read the book? Yes. Yes, I read the book. Uh, uh, my dad sent it to me uh, about last week and uh, spent all night reading it. I was up all night reading. It was uh, quite a surprise to me, some parts of it. Very what interesting. Sense? In what sense? Uh, just uh, some of the things that were, were revealed uh, caught me off guard. And uh, just some, some very big surprises in it for me. Well, what was it that caught you off guard? Uh, some, of, some of his insights into... Uh, what he thought of me as I was growing up. All set? Everybody ready? Okay, let's take all take a deep breath. Your dad comes here to visit about once a month, but I get the impression that that the two of you don't talk a lot about everything that happened, about the crimes in particular. No, we, we don't discuss that because uh, it's been it's been uh, gone over so thoroughly in the papers and, and the media that uh, uh, there's just really no point in, in going in depth into any in depth talks about it. We we talk about uh, our family, uh, home, how things used to be, uh, what uh, prison life is here is like here now, and uh, try to keep. Uh, things as, as light and upbeat as possible. Is it hard for you to go back and talk about those things? Uh, no. no, not not the good things. In fact, it gives me a sense of comfort to talk about uh, the, the few good times there were in the past. You say the few good times. Now, as I'm reading this, it's saying confessions of a serial killer, but I don't believe that they're going to actually speak about the murders. Now, I'm sure that they will only because, you know, that's the reason why he's even infamous is because of the the murders and the the, the brutality in which he uh, emphasized his fantasies. So those things will be covered, but I've watched one where a guy was a serial killer. He was given an interview and there was a couple murders, even though he was convicted of them. He didn't want to speak on them because ultimately it doesn't really matter who the person or what they're in for or what they get convicted of. People still care about public opinion, even when they say they don't. So there's some things that these killers don't want to put themselves in a in a certain light. They don't want people to see them as in a certain way. So even as uh, brutal and gruesome as we all see uh, Dahmer, even now as we did then, there's still you, you, you're, you're going to see this in this interview, right? Which I haven't I haven't watched this interview, but just knowing just knowing the what is it? Just knowing his father, how his father felt about homosexuality. And not like he was just ready to kill you or disown you because you're gay, but you could tell that it's still taboo. So Dahmer, I already know, like I said, I haven't watched this, 
I haven't watched uh, interviews from Dahmer, but just knowing that his father still had a taboo-ness towards his sexuality, I'm sure that he's going to try to downplay his sexuality. And during this interview, let's let's get back into it. Do you think of your childhood as having been profoundly unhappy? No, not profoundly. My childhood wasn't wasn't uh, filled with any any great tragedies or anything. There were good times and there were bad times. I, th- I think it was fairly normal. Jeff, do you remember your your earliest experience and earliest interest, fascination with the inside of animals? Where that came from? Uh, in ninth grade. Uh, in biology class, we had uh, the usual dissection of uh, fetal pigs. I took the remains of that home and, and kept uh, the skeleton of it. Now, I can already see that they're trying to push childhood on Dahmer. It was something that happened in his childhood. It was something because... As we did in 94 and as we do now, we just have this idea and this belief that people are made, that every person is quote unquote good, that every person will always choose good. And it's only when when bad things happen in a person's life and they are kind of edged and eased and kind of led to the dark side do true do people truly become dark and i just i just can't i can't follow that even though i know that it is it is something if we looked at uh 100% of a person it's going to be a, a percentage of a person but ultimately a person makes the choice for themselves let's jump back and i just started branching out uh Dogs, cats. I suppose it could have turned into a, a, a normal hobby like taxidermy, but it, it didn't. It veered off into into this. Why? I, I don't know. All I know is that uh, I wanted to, to see what the insides of these animals looked like. Was there some pleasure in in the cutting open of the animal? Yes, there was. No, no sexual pleasure, but just a. It's hard to describe. Sense of power, sense of control. I suppose that's a good way of putting it, yeah. yeah. Now see here, we're, he's using, the interviewer is using words. And, and this is my biggest gripe I can already see moving forward. Is that the language that we use is the language that's been given. So... Because, quote, because we give, we, we give, what would you, how would you say it? There's a word, I just can't think of it, but it's about giving your trust over to authority. Because someone went to school and quote unquote studied for eight to 10 years, we just assume that they were just the smartest in the most freest abstract thinkers in the world. And and they're not, they are people who, who farted in class. I mean, these doctors, these professors, I mean, they're all right. If it's 11 AM at seven thirty AM, they didn't finish jerking off. Like, so now we're, we're supposed to just hand over all of our doubts and okay, look, this person he got it all under control. Like, mm, nah, he don't got it under control. So the words power, like he's giving him words, which other psychologists gave him word. Look, this is why you did it, and they're kind of leading him to believe that that this is why you did it, as opposed to the truth. I can sort of see a fascination for you know wanting to see. Uh, or looking at right, the insides of animals, say for the first time. After you did it one time, what more is to be gained by looking at another dog's inside, the second yeah, or I the third? Know. I don't know. That's, it that's, became a compulsion, and it switched from 
animals to humans. I, I, I still don't understand it. I don't know why. What would you do with the, with the dead animals, Jeff? You would pick the carcasses up from the road and take them back into the woods. Take them back in the woods, uh, skin them sometimes, uh, slit them slit them all the way open, uh, look at the organs, feel them. There was a sort of ex uh, a general excitement for me. I don't know why. Uh, it, was a, it was exciting to see. One of your dad's biggest questions is when you began to slip away, when you crossed over into this world of obsession or dark fantasy from which you just couldn't return, can you pinpoint that? Do you, is there a sense for when that really began to happen with you, Jeff? I think it was around <clears throat> age 14 or 15. Started have having obsessive uh, thoughts of, of uh, violence uh, intermingled with sex. And it just got worse and worse. And that here he just says something that I realized... Um, a long time ago when I was studying these serial killers, it's the crossing of violence and sex. It's like both of those things start to drive on the same uh, road or the same highway. So if we think of the brain and we think of all of these different roads, now normally... Violence is on its own road. It's violent street. And then you have sex street. But a lot of times with these serial killers. Those two roads merge into one road. Where it's. It's. Whatever that feeling is. Whatever that. Because we we, we know. We, we can identify. With the sexual side. Of impulse. And a force beyond ourself. So once you. It's like a chemical thing. It's once you hit a certain age. Once you go through puberty. Now these thoughts and ideas. Start to. Live in your in your body. Now if you were exposed to this stuff. Before. They really don't take residence. But you know what they are. But. It's not the same. Right. Violence as well. Most of us have been exposed to violence. But at some point with these serial killers. They hit a certain age. I don't know if it's puberty. I don't know what it is, but violence and sex now drives on the same street. And that's very interesting because I would say. Normally, and that's very loose, this is the word normal, because what is normal? But but I don't believe just from a from a passing the genes forward, I don't believe that that both of those things living on the same street is going to be beneficial to our species. So that's why I would say that is not normal because it's not advantageous to humans in the long run if you just want to kill every creature or every human that you have sex with like that's not that's not advancing human nature that's not advancing the human species so that's why i would say that that is not normal but most of these serial killers they all have that and they have a few other traits that are similar but but this one is one as well uh, I didn't know how to tell anyone about it, so I didn't. I just kept it all inside. Do you have any sense for where that was coming from? No. No, I've, I've talked with uh, a few psychologists about it. They, they have their theories, but they don't have any concrete answers either. Do you have a theory? No, not really. I, I don't know where, where it came from. Uh, I probably will never know. But I, I never, I never dreamed that it would uh, become a reality. Coming up, more pointed questions for a serial killer. Why the cannibalism? Do 
Jeffrey Dahmer was finally caught in 1991 after one of his would-be victims escaped and alerted police. What was discovered in Dahmer's apartment was horrifying. Body parts in a barrel, a human head in a refrigerator. When he confessed, the gruesome details were almost impossible to comprehend. What was it, Jeff, that took you over the edge, do you think, and made you take this from the world of fantasy into reality? Now, before he answers that question, there are two different accounts of how that interaction with the police went. The first, just like um, when we were talking about Genesis, <laughs> the two different stories, the two different creation stories in Genesis, we have two different stories of how the the intricate details on how Dahmer gets caught. So, the first one was the this part is the same that the cops take um, the victim. They take him back to Dahmer's apartment and they go inside. So one, so this is where it veers off. One says that he, that the cop looked in the refrigerator and saw the human head and he uh, screamed out or yelled out like, ah, and then Dahmer attacked. Dahmer uh, tried to either rush or get away or, but, Dahmer initiated some type of um, physical interaction. They take him down. Boom. The second one is that the cops, they're in, right? Everything else. They're in the apartment. One of the cops is going through the drawer and he's looking at the photos and he says, uh, oh, man, these are real. And he's like, yo, these are real. All right. So he says that. And then Dahmer tries to initiate. Um, some that physical conflict. So you have these two things that are living at the same time. It, and it's just lets you know that a lot of the details in the story can get convoluted. From uh, 15 on, I, I had this reoccurring fantasy of, uh, of uh, meeting a hitchhiker on the road. And, uh, of taking him hostage and and doing what I wanted with him. About three years later, I was 18 years old, driving home. Uh, I saw this hitchhiker about a mile from my house. Thought to myself, should I stop and pick him up, or should I just keep on going? Uh, I wish I just keep on kept on going, but I didn't. I turned around, picked him up, and. Uh, that's when that's when it, the nightmare became a reality. Now, this part, this part, it just, in this whole story, it just got me thinking about time and how we, we don't really understand time. But even though we don't understand it, it is still benefiting in our favor. Time, our thoughts, our wants and needs, the things that we desire is it's it's like it's speaking to us. It's it's calling us as well. It wants us as well. So here you have Dahmer who said ever since he was 15, he had fantasies of picking up some hitchhiker. And then eventually three years later. He picks up a hitchhiker. Those of us who have other fantasies, let's say it's a fantasy of wealth. It's a fantasy of of stability. It's a fantasy of a job, of a promotion, of a family. We have these ideas and we have these wants and desires and we can have them for years. And. The opportunity will come our way, but it's up to us to seize on those opportunities. And like I said, I'm not I'm not taken away from the horrendous crimes that that Dahmer committed. But. His wants and his desires. They came true. So. Like I was saying with time. 
we can look at our life and you can say that your wants and your desires will come true um, as long as you are actively seeking them. So the opportunity came and I'm sure the opportunity came a few times and he didn't act on it, but then he acted on it. So it's, it, you could just say, all right, so what came first, the chicken or the egg? So if we're looking at time like a painting, if we look at time like the Mona Lisa and we're at one corner, we're at one corner of it. And in order to to experience the whole Mona Lisa painting, how many. That's a lifetime. That you would have to go th- so that you can get through the whole Mona Lisa, right, because you're actually moving in it like a 3D game. So you have this urge, let's say you have an urge for, because uh, they have a lot of hidden meanings and a lot of small other paintings within it. Let's say when you're at the corner, you have this idea of a lion. And because we know the painting, right? And those of you who know where the lion is, you know that eventually moving through this, you will encounter a lion. Would you have had that lion idea if you were on let's say um a starry night which it would be no you would have the thoughts of a starry night you would have because that is that is the painting that you're on so that's why i say that this really opened my eyes about time because he had these visions and these thoughts they they did come true and i talked about this in our um Timeline. What 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 phrase did I use? Re, a timeline reverberation, where the timeline, the series of events, your life has already happened. We're just living through what happened. So, but everything that happened reverberates all the way through the whole timeline. And, and he even said this in another interview. He said that he was always like this. He said. It was nothing that nobody did. Like he always felt something. He felt something was off. He just didn't know because of the the age that he was. I mean, how would you even imagine? Um, even if you were having nightmares about people getting uh, cut up or eaten, but you don't know that what that is because you haven't been exposed to it. And you don't know that that is you. You are the one that's doing it. Right. So. Here, like I said, it's just more of just like a a confirmation of timeline reverberation that the things that you want, you only want them because you do get them. We just don't know when he was having these ideas and these visions profoundly at 15. But three years later, he actually acted on it. It it just seems so bizarre to me that this obsession that I had been thinking about and wanting just uh, all the all the parts are there and they, they make it possible to make it happen what happened after you took him to the house the house was empty my uh, mother was up in Chippewa Falls with her family and my dad was living in a, in a uh, rented motel about five miles away due to the divorce and uh, I, I pretty much had the, the place to myself I was drinking a lot during that time and just, uh, I don't know, looking for something to, uh, some way to find some fulfillment, some some pleasure. And I acted on my fantasies and uh, that's where everything went wrong. This was the summer of 1978 when you took your first victim. Right. Once it happened the first time, it just seemed like uh, it had control of my life from there on in. The second occurrence was 1984, roughly. And I met this guy at one of the uh, bars, downtown Milwaukee bars. We went back to the hotel. Just planning on uh, getting drunk, I had put some sleeping pills in his drink to render him unconscious. So here, he says, I uh, just plan on getting drunk but i put sleeping pills 
in his drink. Just the fact that she put sleeping pills in his drink, that lets us know that you, it just wasn't about going back getting drunk because I've gotten drunk with my homies a few times when I was young and no one slipped anything in anybody's drinks and we didn't have any sexual encounters. Why? Because that's not with neither one. Like nobody wanted that. We were only getting drunk and just experiencing getting drunk, just experiencing alcohol. Right. So my point is that he doesn't want to admit that this is what he wanted. That he wanted to drug people and he wanted to take advantage of people. Like he doesn't want to admit that. I we I just I just wanted to get drunk. I don't know why I why I put some type of drug in his alcohol to render him unconscious. It's like uh you do know. You just don't want to say it. You don't want to truly accept who you are. And um uh was just going to spend the night with him. When I woke up in the morning, uh, my forearms were bruised and his chest was, was bruised and blood was coming out of his mouth. He was hanging over the side of the bed and uh, I have no memory of beating him to death, but I must have. And that's when it, when it all started again. Now, just just that story. That's questionable because we know that he could have um, and I believe that's what leading. The leading consciousness says and believes that he actually got some of that uh, drug in his system as well. And that's why he. He could have went unconscious. He doesn't know what happened. But I I would say that, okay, let's say he got a little bit in there. He got a little bit of the drug in there, and it, and it happened by accident. But he went there to kill, I would say. Now, just the fact that he says that he doesn't remember that because he's admitting, yes, I killed him. I beat him to death. But he doesn't want to admit what happened. And for that, I would like to head over to John Wayne Gacy's story. Now, his story, his early story, we're not going to jump all the way in there. Not on this episode, but we'll we're going to get to him maybe in the, the sec or the third. Right. Because if this is the first, the second one's going to be um, me trying to remember last week's episode episode that was never recorded. And then the third one, we'll do John Wayne Gacy. We'll do a, a confession, which he's lying a lot, but it's still a little bit of truth in there. Right. But Gacy, when he was young, he was molested by his father's friend. Now his father was um, a homophobe. His father just hated gays and he, he just, always teased his son about it and things of that nature. Well, his father's friend used to make uh, Gacy p- uh, perform oral sex on him. He could have did even more, but so we have those two pillars kind of shaping Gacy's killing. Like he was still, he still wanted to kill that. That didn't really affect him, but would it, but what, how that affected him was, Another incident where his first like gay relationship, he felt like he was uh, because he was the bottom. He felt like he was manipulated. He was used. He he felt like he was a sucker. So he wanted to make sure that in these relationships, he would not be the sucker that his the partner who, or whoever else would be on the receiving and would be the, the sucker. Right. So even when he would kill these guys these kids, I mean, that's what they were when he would kill these kids. It was all about torturing 
So he's trying to inflict pain. He's trying to inflict pain on himself for being weak and not being strong enough to fight off and defend against the man, right? His father's friend. So these are like psychological reasons that are truthful. But just the fact that Dahmer's talking about he doesn't know, right? Because uh, Gacy would not talk about those type of things. He would not talk about him receiving and being a bottom because he felt that that was a um, a status of weakness. And he didn't want to talk and put himself in the light of weakness. So as we listen to Dahmer talk about his second body, his second killing, his second victim, the fact that he's saying that he doesn't know and he doesn't remember, because if he took the drug, just like the other guy took the drug, then he would just be out. We know that it renders you fully unconscious and that you are, you're just out of it. Right? So we know this. He knows this. So he knows the effect of the drug. So when he tells us, well, I don't remember because he knows the effect of the drug, not because he's taken the drug, just because he knows the effect. So this is just a way for him to avoid what really happened. We know that he beats, we know that he beat the guy to death. But we don't know why. And I believe that Dahmer knows why. I believe that he knows why. And that he just uses the, uh, I, I, I took some and my memory was gone. I think he's just using that as a cop out to not really talk about what happened. Just like another killer didn't want to talk about the child murders. He murdered kids, but he didn't want to talk about it. Um, what's the uh, Ramirez? I can't think of his first name. But the Night Stalker, he molested children, but he didn't want to talk about those about that. He didn't want to talk about molesting kids. He only wanted to talk about killing adults, killing women. But he molested kids like six year old kids, but he didn't want to talk about that. So these people, like I said earlier, like they know what's going on, even though they are killing people, even though they're vile, even though he ate people. Def- we're talking about Dahmer, even though he uh, was participating in cannibalism, he still there's still certain things, certain titles that he doesn't want on him. And I believe that that's the reason why that second murder, he's pretending that he doesn't remember what happened. I believe that he does know what happened. But if he told what had happened, then we would know what what it is that he's truly afraid of far as what titles are he. What titles uh, would he be afraid of? So that's why he's just pretending that he doesn't know. I don't I don't know what happened. OK. Once it started again, you found it impossible to stop. Right. That That's when the, the obsession went into full swing. Did you ever tell yourself, I have to stop this? I must stop doing this? Yes. When it was going that. on? After After the second time. It seemed like the compulsion to do it was too strong, and I, I didn't even try to stop it after that. But uh, after, before the second time, things had been building up gradually, uh, going to bookstores, going to uh, the bars, the gay bars, uh, bath clubs. When that, did, when that wasn't enough, uh, buying sleeping pills and, and using it on uh, various guys in the bath clubs, it just escalated slowly but surely. And uh, after the second time, which was uh, not planned, uh, it was out of control. It felt like it was out of control. Where did sex enter in to the killings, Jeff? All right, so here we go. Remember what I said? His father is not a devout hater, and he wants all homosexuals killed, but... It's still taboo. So let's see how Dahmer views um, these sexual encounters, which I feel like he's going to try to downplay. He's going to lie about the true nature of his sexuality. Let's check it out. It was a big part of it. Okay. My my only objective was to find the the best looking uh, guy that I could. Their sexual preference didn't matter to me. Did their race matter to you? No, their race didn't matter to me. The first, the first two young men were white. The, set, the third young man was American Indian. The fourth 
and fifth were Hispanic. So no, race had nothing to do with it. It was just their looks. Was there something sexual in the dismemberment of the bodies for you? As time went on, uh, yes, I, I did get a, there was a sexual part, part to that. Uh, I started saving the, the skeletons and preserving other parts. And uh, one thing led to another. It took, it took more and more uh, deviant type behaviors to satisfy uh, my urges. And so it just uh, spiraled out of control. Why the cannibalism? It, it, it made me feel like they were uh, a permanent part of me. Besides, besides the just mere curiosity of what it would be like, it made them feel that they were a part of me. And it, it... So here we have a piece of the truth, which is the curiosity of what would it be like Right. So the part about leaving and I think that is manufactured. I think that that's just something that psychologists, they just kind of put that in there. They're just thinking. And so he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. But the truth, I would say, would be he had a, a fascination with and because he was so used to um, ripping in dismembering his victims. I believe that just based off of this, I would even think that he, he actually, and this is something that he didn't talk about, but I would say that he probably ate some of uh, those animals that he found and that he did his, uh, what would it taxidermy or wh whatever you would call it when he's performing these operations on them. I would say I would think that he that he uh, tried to take some of them. That he actually, and it's so taboo. It's more taboo than humans, and that's why we don't hear about it. I don't know if we're going to hear about it in this interview, but far as dogs and cats, I, I'm sure that he ate them too. So this is just an extension of the curiosity and just the fascination with death. gave me a, a sexual uh, uh, satisfaction to do that. Was it the killing that excited you, or is it what happened after the killing? No, the, the killing was just a means to an end. That, that was the least set, uh, satisfactory part. I didn't enjoy doing that. That's why I tried to uh, create uh, living zombies with... Uh, muriatic acid in the, in the drill. Now he has 17 to 18 or 17 to 20 victims. He, at the height, he was killing once a week, but he says that the killing was not the biggest part. So I would think that he, it would, I believe that it would have to be the killing because if it was just taking these bodies apart, then he would have just broken into the morgue or uh, cemeteries, which he, he said he did try or at least thought about digging up a body. So there's other ways to get bodies and to get dead people other than killing them. So it's that was a big part. And so he doesn't want to admit that. He doesn't want to admit that the killings was a big part. But for you to have 20 bodies and you were killing at least one person a week. I mean, clearly it's killing like that is what you wanted to do. That's what you like. That's you like to kill. You like to kill people. That's it, you can't get 20 bodies if you don't like killing people. Uh, but it, it never worked. No, the killing wasn't wasn't the objective. I just wanted to have 
the person under my complete control, not having to, to consider their wishes, being able to keep them there as long as I wanted. I believe. Uh, it's not easy to say that, but that's, that's what the motive was. Where did that need for control come from? Do you have any idea? I don't know. Maybe I felt uh, I had no control as a, as a child or young adult. And uh, that got mixed in with my sexuality, and I ended up doing what I did was my way of, of feeling in, in complete control. Now see, again, here, these are just words of psychologists. That's all, the, that's all we're, we're hearing right now, because if we go to Ohio... If we go, uh, there was one maybe in New York. I mean, there, there are these type of cases all over where people kidnap and hold women, just hold them hostage for years. One, I think her name was Amanda Barnes. That was in Ohio, I want to say. And so there was two, I think the last name was Rodriguez. And it was a brother. So it was him and his brother. They kidnapped a girl. And so they had two of them. I want to say they had like two or three women that they kidnapped. And they just held them hostage in their house. And these women gave birth to different kids. And they just held them there. And there was a father who did this to his daughter. He built like a dungeon or whatever. And he just held his daughter. And uh, and maybe she had, I don't know how many kids, three to six kids with her father that had imprisoned her. Right. So my point there is that people who just want to keep people and control them and do all of these things that they do that, they don't kill them. So the fact that Dahmer is killing, and this is something that he doesn't want to admit, but he liked killing. He, that's what he wanted to do. He, if he did not want to kill, then he would not kill. He would, he would just hold these people hostage forever, right? And we got to say, though, okay, you don't want to get caught. You don't want to go to jail. Well, then what do you do then? So if you just held all 20 of these people, well, you can't because he lives in, a, in an apartment. He lives in a low-income apartment building. So you can't just have 20 people, right? You can't even have one person because they're going to scream. They're going to do all of this stuff. Well, then... Now that's not the focus that you really want is to control. Yes, you it's a, it's like uh it's like commercials. We all have our favorite commercials, but we don't want commercials. But because we do have them, we have our favorites. But if we could just clap our hands and just have no commercials, then there would be no commercials. So the controlling and all of that stuff is a byproduct. The co- the controlling is just the the commercial. And the actual thing that he really loves and gets off on is going to be is going to be killing. Because other than that, there's other ways to still control these people. Well, not I'm sure not the exact ones, because you you would you would just have to find people that you could control. At least for that situation, creating my own little world where I had the final say. Uh finding the best looking guy that I could and uh, having total mastery over him for as long as I wanted. Lust played a big part of it. Controlling lust. That uh, that was the motive right there. A lot of this came out in the course of the trial. Obviously both of you sat through this. Have the two of you sat down and talked about these things before? <clears throat> no. Not in depth. This is the first time you're talking about these things with your, I've talked with your dad about here. At great length with, with uh, psychiatrists, court appointed psychiatrists, psychologists, but uh, not with my family. I we, learned, we learned everything at the trial and in the confessions and that sort of thing after the fact. The two of you never really communicated all that much, did you, father and son? Not on, an, not on any deep, deep level, no. We talked about superficial things. Uh, never really had a, a real deep heart-to-heart talk about what was going on inside our own minds. 
I was I was always a very private person. I didn't like to uh, open up and, and share anything with anyone. Uh, I like to keep my thoughts to myself. Why do you think that was? Uh, because from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable with anyone. There. So I just uh, closed myself off and put on uh, a mask of normalcy. Coming up. Were you surprised to read that about your dad? Uh, very surprised. I suppose everyone has their, their secret thoughts. When I interviewed Jeffrey Dahmer in 1994, his father Lionel had just written a book as part of his own painful journey to try and understand how his son became a serial killer. Despite regular visits to the prison, father and son had never spoken about many of the topics covered in the book until our interview. You've read the book. Right. He called it a father's story. Pretty simple title. Right. Not a simple story, though. No, not a simple story. Not one that was easy for me to read. But uh, I'm glad he wrote it. Did it hurt? Was it painful to read? Yes, it was painful. Some parts of it were, uh, for me, were even fun to read. There were, there were good parts. To it. it wasn't all negative. Was it emotional for you reading the book? Yes, it was. Tell me, what kind of feelings did you have reading it? Uh, deep regret, um, sorrow, I guess those were the two main emotions. Is there anything in this book that you strongly disagree with? Uh, yes, I, I disagree with uh, the description of me as, as being so uh, incredibly shy and introverted because maybe that's that's the way my dad saw me because uh, there was there was so much tension in the home that I really didn't uh, feel like being up and uh, happy a lot of the times uh, but with my friends in school uh, I had I had uh, a good time we had good you know good uh, social life and so I wasn't uh, so so extremely reclusive and uh, self-centered as, as it portrays me. Does it surprise you to hear Jeff say that he doesn't think of himself and never did as innately shy? It did surprise me. Uh, maybe my perception was uh, accentuated to the extreme. But you do recall at age six that you became more aware of tensions in the home. Oh yeah, that's, that's the time I really, really remember uh, noticing that things weren't quite right. So it wasn't so much innate shyness as it was wanting to withdraw from tension and arguments and problems in the house. That's how I saw it, yeah. I uh, sort of uh, lived in my own little fantasy world when things got too heated in the household. And uh, I carried that over for, for years, I guess. And was there violence in that fantasy world? No, no, not Early on? That, not, not that... Uh, not the type that showed itself later, no. It was just uh, just my own little world where I had control. Was, was anger a part of it for you, Jeff? I had some anger. Probably every kid has some anger, you know, about their childhood. Uh, it really wasn't, uh, wasn't a terrible childhood, though. You know, there were, there were a lot of good times. It wasn't... Uh, it wasn't a really terrible time. So Pat theories about you as a serial killer striking out to get back at your dad, for all, instance, don't all ring baloney. True to you. No, that has no truth in it. The only motive that there ever was was to completely control a person, a person that I found physically attractive, and uh, keep them with me as long as possible, even if it meant just keeping apart of them. Did you know before you read this book that your dad had his own obsessions and fantasies that he had thought about, that he had 
dreamed of committing murder, that he had uh, uh, had an obsession with fire and with explosives? No, that's. Uh, that, I don't think that's the type of thing one asks one's dad. Were you surprised to read that about your dad? Uh, very surprised. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know what to think about it. Uh, I suppose everyone has their their secret thoughts, and so it was somewhat of a shock. Now here, I believe that that we all are a product of the genes of our parents. Like when when I look at when I look at my kids, I can see. Certain things that they do, I can see their mother. And I'm sure certain things that they do, their mother can see me, right? So so that, I believe, is true. So when the father says that he had these ideas and he had these thoughts, I think that's true. But I think that all humans have those thoughts. I don't think that there is a human that does not have those thoughts. And well, you got to think about the time, right? The time that his father was growing up, it would have been around Vietnam. So he's seeing war, he's seeing brutality, he's seeing uh, racial tensions, like he's seeing all of these things. So of course he's going to fantasize about it. Dahmer is going to have all of these type of fantasies. Um, I remember as a kid just looking at, G.I. Joe at the cartoon and, and wanting to go into the army. So when you want to go into the army, if you're talking about fighting Cobra, Cobra fighting Cobra means killing Cobra. Like that's what it means. It doesn't mean that you just get into a couple fights and y'all fist fighting and then you just go home and the other guy goes home and maybe y'all going to go, go fight tomorrow. Now, even though that's what the cartoon is showing you, um, but all of these cartoons, Tom and Jerry, it doesn't matter what cartoon you're watching for boys is going to be promoting violence is going to be promoting uh, winning the movies, the the shows, just whatever is going to be promoting this behavior. So, of course, you're going to gravitate towards it. Of course, you're going to say like, yeah, man, this is what I want to do. So I don't think that it's a surprise that my father or that your father, that you would have any of these thoughts. That's not going to be the surprising part. But what is surprising is that you don't think that other people have these thoughts. Like that's surprising is that Dahmer himself was surprised that his father thought about killing women, which. I've never thought about like I've never just was like, man, man, what if I just killed some women like I like that's a thought that never crossed my path. But but Dahmer's father, he did. He did think about that. Right. So there I I believe that that's when you have some type of disconnect with your mother. Do you think about hurting women? And. Like I said, it's where these things cross over where violence and sexuality lives on the same path. Now Dahmer, he wanted to kill men. His father thought about killing women, right? So it's, it's about what you're sexually attracted to. But I think that we all have these ideas and these thoughts of violence because that is human nature. And that's what you've been shown. Do you feel grateful that your father wrote this book? Or do you feel put off by it? I mean, I'm just curious about your, your overall reaction to it. Do you feel, a, is the book an invasion, do you think? or is it No, something? no, I, I feel uh, nothing but pride for him for writing the book and uh, having the courage to uh, bear his soul when he didn't have to. He, did, he didn't have to get involved with uh, trying to, you know, help me out and support me and be a, an emotional support for me. And uh, I'll be grateful to him forever for it. Jeffrey Dahmer kept many secrets even before he killed his first victim. 
While it's not unusual for teenagers to keep some things from their parents, Dahmer's father was tormented by the idea that perhaps he had missed a key sign of what was to come and the chance to stop him. But Jeffrey Dahmer wasn't sure he would have revealed anything and was angered by the way some people had blamed his parents. Did you ever consider talking to your parents, to your dad, about homosexuality? Is that something no, you felt you could ever raise? Early on, I, I really didn't know that much about it myself. Uh, all I knew was that it was something that uh, was to be kept hush-hush, not uh, talked about, not even thought about. So I just uh, kept it all within me and never... So we're going to stop it here. This is an hour in. In this interview, we are 24 minutes in. And we might pick it up, and then that way we can finish. We might publish, um, because I think this might take about three three episodes. So we might pump all three of those out this week. And then that way, um, or... We'll record the rest of them, right? So record the other two episodes and just have them scheduled uh, for next week and then the week after. And then we will um, publish or we could just do the whole thing. I think it's probably an hour left. So that's where I like to be at anyway. But, you know, with my talking, it'll probably be two hours. So the next episode will be two hours. We're going to finish this um, Confessions of Dahmer and then we'll get into... um, the episode that was lost. So, so there it is. Uh, definitely, uh, you guys have a great week. Thank you for hanging out. And I definitely want to just thank you guys for supporting me. Like I see the support and it's just very humbling that I have an audience and I have a group of people who like listening to what I have to say and share some of the same interests. Now I know you can't share all the interests. Some of you guys don't like Tekken just yet, but we're still going to be preaching the Tekken gospel here on this uh, podcast. (laughs) But uh, I definitely just thank you guys for um, hanging out for the times that you do. So I definitely appreciate you. You matter. I want you to know that, that you matter and that it doesn't matter how old you are. The visions that you have are not in vain. These ideas and these thoughts and these wants that you guys want, it doesn't matter. Like you still can achieve them. Yes, we still have, we we are still affected. And that's one of the things that was lost in that episode is where I talk about it takes nine months Right. It takes nine months to to be born into this world. There's a process no matter what. So let's say if you're a dog, it takes nine months, but it takes nine dog months. Right. Which would only give us what? Maybe three. I would say three months before they um, give birth. Right. But if you're a tree, it may take even longer. So but it's now nine tree months, which may take 10 years, 10 human years. It may take five human years, right? So just just know that whatever you want and whatever your desires, that it takes time to develop. It No matter what it is on this plane, you have to take time to develop. We're going to get into that on the third episode. This was the first, second was we're going to finish the Dahmer confessions, and then we're going to get into, into the wants and the desires of us and just understanding that everything is takes a process. So, I love you guys. Reese's. P-p-p-p-p-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c-c